The Old Testament lesson for today is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 7, verses 14 through 24, page 44 in your pew Bible. The first plague God sent on Egypt in order to set Israel free was a plague of water turning into blood. Exodus 7, beginning with verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the water. Wait on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that has changed into a snake. Then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the desert. But until now you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will sink, stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in the wooden buckets and stone jars. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not take even this to his heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water because they knew they could not drink the water of the river. The New Testament lesson is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 8, verses 1 through 13, page 871 of the Pew Bible. When the Lamb opens the seventh seal, there is first of all silence. Then the prayers of the saints ascend to heaven, followed by thunder, lightning, and earthquakes. Then follow the first four of the seven trumpet judgments of God. Revelation 8, starting with verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there come peals of thunder, rumblings, flashings of lightning, and an earthquake. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel is taken today from the book of Luke, chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, uh, page 742 in your pew Bible. Jesus tells the parable of the persistent widow to show that we should always pray and never give up. Luke 18, verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. 
And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and I will not God and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Here ends the reading of the lesson. Well, that's amazing. She didn't even have to tell you to sit down, and you just did it. I was going to have you stay standing and reach for the sky, and we'll just, and you can if you want to. I'm not going to make you, but, you know, last week was a, an interesting week. I didn't exactly mark it on the calendar, but it really stood out in my mind because I've never seen this church as sleepy as it was last week. <laughs> the most yawns per capita that I've ever seen, but, you know, to your, to your credit, you were here and you fought it. You stayed awake right to the end of the sermon, so that was good. Uh, but, you know, we, the good thing is to get up and stretch and reach for the sky, and if you want to do that, I'll, I'll just lead you in that. But if you want to stay seated, that's okay. Anybody want to stand up and stretch? Okay, we're good to go. That's great. <clears throat> A couple weeks ago, we read about in uh, Revelation 6, the uh, opening of the seven seals, except for we only had six of them. Only had six. And today, in chapter 8, we get to the seventh seal, finally. Um, <clears throat> what does the seal amount to? What does it reveal? The seven seals, uh, the seventh seal seems to imitate, or not imitate, initiate. You know, I took my jacket off because I was getting hot. Maybe it's just that, I don't know if it's in here or if it's all the sun I got yesterday. I'm a little redder than normal, but uh, it didn't really help my tongue any. So hopefully I'll get untracked here in a minute. The seventh seal seems to uh, initiate the seven trumpets. First, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour in John's mind, and then there was um, the prayers arising to God, and then the seven trumpets began to sound. And so that's what chapter 8 is about. Uh, first, there was silence. Why silence? Why this long wait between the six and seven uh, seals? Well, seven, as we know, is the number of perfections, the number of completion. And in all of creation, Romans 8 tells about all of creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. They're waiting for God's glory to be restored in Romans 8, chapter 20, uh, verse 20 or so. And so I believe the seven seals just reflects that as the seventh seal is be, uh, about to be opened. Every, all of creation is just waiting, and that's the heaven and earth. Origen, who was an early saint in the church, um, uh, a great interpreter of the Bible, he said in every service there is at least two audiences or two groups of people. There's the group of people that are gathered, and then there's the angels and the saints that are gathered together, the unseen audience. And it's that way here, the unseen and the seen all are waiting with bated breath, so to speak, for what God is going to do at the seventh seal. Now, with Revelation, it's not quite that simple. The seventh seal does, is not the end. There's more to come. The seven trumpet judgments first come before. But as Habakkuk said, let all the earth be silent in his presence. And they certainly were silent as the Lamb of God, the Son of God, opened up the seventh seal. And as it was opened then, we see the prayers of the saints being offered. The angel brought Incense, much incense, it says, and the prayers were off offered up to God. God surely hears and answers our prayers. That was part of the children's sermon. It's part of the songs we're singing today. And we know that. Sometimes we doubt, sometimes we wonder at the way God answers prayers, but I think we all accept that God hears and answers our prayers. He loves to answer prayer. And certainly Revelation 8 is one of those verses that teaches that. 
So much so, God withholds his judgment until the prayers are offered. To me, that's such an important point. We have all this stuff happening in heaven in Revelation, the opening of the seals, the trumpets to come. But before any of that happens, God wants to make sure that he hears all our prayers. He's not going to act without our prayers. First of all, God wants to know what we have to say about things, what our cries of our hearts are as well as our worship and praise. God wants to hear our prayers, and only then will he continue with what he's about to do. Even if our prayers don't seem to us to be answered, we can rest assured that they are, partly because the Bible says so, partly because we don't recognize some of his answers as they happen. But God does answer. And it's all of our prayers in chapter 8 of Revelation, verse 3 and 4, it says twice. And it doesn't say, answer some of the prayers. Or it doesn't say, answer the prayers of some saints. But it says specifically, answers the prayers of all the saints. The prayers of the saints. All of our prayers are heard and are important to God. So with our gospel reading, Jesus taught the disciples, and if we are a follower of his, we are his disciple too. He taught us that it's important to pray and not give up. That was the whole point of that parable. And the end verse of that, verse 8, Luke 18, verse 8, Jesus said something that at first glance appears to be not on the subject at all, but actually has everything to do with it. He said, when the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith on the earth? And why is that? What does that have to do with prayer? And I think it's just this. Faith prays. If we're not a praying people, our faith is deficient. There is no point in praying if we don't believe. And yet, on the other hand, if we believe, we're going to be praying a lot. We don't need so much exhortation, so much encouragement to pray because if we have faith, we're going to be doing that. Faith is something that prays, but the times, the end times will be so hard. And that's what Jesus was getting at also. In his end times discourse, it'll be so hard that many people will fall away. Their, prayer, their faith uh, is, is shallow, like the rocky soil, like the thorn-infested soil in another parable. And so it was a fair question Jesus asked. When he comes again, will he find faith on the earth? It's the need for us to stand firm. And so we exercise our faith, not only by doing what the Bible says, but also by praying. Faith prays. And surely, as we read in Revelation 8, we want to continue that because all prayers will be answered. We can remember also, even the prayers of the saints who were martyred in Revelation 6. Remember the fifth seal? He saw the martyred souls under the altar of God still praying that their blood might be avenged. And now God is about to answer those prayers in chapter 8. We go on in Revelation 8 with verse 5. After the prayers, then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, hurled it on the earth, and there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. But what do these things signify? These things happened before. They happened several times throughout the scriptures. And in every instance, it's an indication that God is about to show up. God is present. These things happened on Mount Sinai as... Moses brought the people near. The Lord descended on Mount Sinai and there was earthquakes and thunders and lightnings and a loud trumpet blast and fire and smoke. Again, when Elijah fled from the presence of wicked Queen Jezebel, he went down to Mount Sinai and there again, earthquake <coughs> and wind, God came and spoke to Elijah. We remember also, even 
at the crucifixion, earthquakes. These things happen as God comes down to earth. The earth itself cannot bear up under God's presence without reacting. Sometimes we say when we talk to an unresponsive person, it's like talking to a brick wall. But the earth itself is not unresponsive in the Lord's presence. The earth itself trembles. And so what is the real brick wall in creation is someone who doesn't respond to God. When even the rocks cry out as his presence. We move on then to the trumpets. Then the seven angels in verse 6 who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound the trumpets. What are trumpets for? Again, the, as revelation as it unfolds, we see so much symbol, symbolism, so much imagery that is taken from the rest of the Bible. And what are the trumpets for? The trumpets were sounded to gather God's people, to gather them together for some important purpose or some event. They were called together for war, for instruction, to fast, to march. In the case of the Israelites, it's time to move, to announce the year of the Jubilee or some other new, new festival, the beginning of the new year, to call the people to assembly. And here in Revelation 8, the trumpets announce the ju judgments of God. They're coming. They're announcing his people to prepare, to watch out, because it's time now for the judgment of God to begin. The first four trumpets are blown. And they, this, these first four judgments all appear in, in a group. And it's the same as with the seals, the seven seals. The first four seals appeared as a group. You might remember the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And then came the fifth and sixth seal, and those went together. So also the fifth and sixth trumpets will go together, as we'll see next week. And just like there was a dramatic interlude, a pause, another vision, things taking place before the seventh seal, so also with the seventh trumpet judgment. Things happen in between the sixth and seventh trumpets. In Revelation 6, when the seals began to be opened, one, one fourth of the world was affected by what was to come. Here in Revelation 8 with the trumpet judgments, we now see one third of the world. So the heat is turned up. The judgments are more severe. And the first four trumpets are basically directed against the natural world, whereas the fifth and sixth are directed more toward people in that world. And then we read what the trumpets actually were. The first angel sounded his trumpet and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees and all the green grass. Hail and fire and blood coming down on earth. Sounds horrible and I'm sure it will be when it happens. But this too has happened before. The plague in Egypt the uh, sixth plague, I think it was, was a plague of hail and fire falling from heaven. Almost the exact same thing. Worst thing, worst hailstorm that had ever happened in Egypt's history. And again, this is repeated at the first trumpet, except now it's one third of the earth. Amos foresaw this fire from heaven burning up the earth in chapter 7. In his day, he saw that it was about to happen to Israel. But through his intercession, through his praying, God with, uh, withdrew that event. But he's not going to withdraw at the end of time. It's the first trumpet judgment. Hail and fire falling from heaven. The second and third trumpets judgments, the waters of the earth are affected. This also is like the plagues in Egypt, like the Israel's Israelites experience in Egypt the very first plague which we read about in our Old Testament lesson was the waters turning to blood the waters of the Nile and in the third trumpet the waters were made bitter just as soon as the Israelites got away from Egypt right after they crossed the Red Sea and went into the wilderness 
they came to an oasis, but the waters were bitter. So bitter they couldn't drink, and it doesn't just mean bad tasting, it means poison. And that's especially the picture in, in uh, Revelation. Those who drink that water will die. In Exodus, when the Israelites came to that oasis of bitter water, the Lord showed Moses a stick to throw into that water, and it became sweet. And the saints throughout history have seen that as symbolism for the cross of Christ makes our bitter life sweet and livable again. He renews all things. That's what God is in the process of doing with all these judgments. We read the seven seals. We read the trumpet judgments. And later on, the bowls of God's wrath. We wonder about all the violence on all the terrifying events and what is going on here. But it's that God is removing evil from the earth. God is in the process of making a new heaven and a new earth. And evil cannot abide in that heavenly kingdom. The fourth trumpet introduces darkness of one third of the sun, moon, and the stars, and consequently of the day and the night as well. In the ninth plague of Egypt was a darkness also that could be felt, which set the stage for the tenth and final plague on Egypt. Here in Revelation, the plague of darkness sets the stage for the last three trumpets, the last three which were so bad that an eagle flew through the air warning the people of the earth how bad it would be at the last three trumpets. Again, darkness was prophesied by the prophet Amos in chapter 8, a darkness that came true again when Jesus was crucified. We remember that darkness fell over the whole land Major portions of the empire were darkened at the moment of Jesus' crucifixion. But here, one-third of the earth will be affected. So what does all these plagues and judgments and all this stuff happening? You know, it sounds like a horrible world. As, as bad as things sometimes are, the world we see around us is still beautiful. It's basically safe. We're not afraid to go outside. The weather is good for the most part. Last week we kind of wondered sometimes, but the weather is good. It's nice to be outside. We can do things. We can live and be happy in the world. But with hail and fire falling from the sky, waters turning to blood, what a horrible place. What a terrible process. What can we, what does this mean? What can we take from this chapter of Revelation? And there's several points I think that speak to me on this point. First of all, the last plagues are similar to earlier plagues. Whatever's happening in the Bible, whatever happens at the end has happened before. And when we see God at work, for instance, in the plagues of Egypt, when we see God at work in the kingdom of Israel, and we see these same things happening in Revelation, we can take comfort in the fact that God is at work here. God is doing a wonderful thing, no matter how terrifying it might seem to us. God is here. God is with us. He has not abandoned us or left us alone. We sang that great hymn, it's, There's Peace in My Soul. And we can have that peace if we're on God's side. We remember that in the sixth chapter, or actually the seventh chapter, God placed a mark, a seal of ownership on his people, those who believe in him, those who trust in him. They'll be protected from much of this judgment that is to fall upon the earth. God is doing something similar to what he's already done before, except this time it's just going to be over the whole earth. Secondly, God will judge and punish evil. God will have mercy and save the righteous. God is both merciful and loving and 
an angry judge. I mean, some people rebel against one or the other. Some people are really strong on the judgment of God and they forget about his love. And a, a more common danger these days, God is love. He wouldn't send anybody to hell. But the Bible teaches, recall the kindness and the severity of God. Romans eleven twenty two. We're safe if we trust in him. If we don't trust in him, if we don't follow him, if we disbelieve and disobey, we're not at all safe. We have much reason to tremble with fear. God will punish evil. We, we sometimes think, you know, with the psalmist, Psalm 73 is such a great psalm. It corrects a lot of bad thinking that sometimes we have. Like, like evil people get away with anything, get away with murder, so to speak. And in the news in the past few years, we've actually seen people do that. We think they get away with murder. But when God is the judge, do people get away with anything? No, they do not. There comes a time when everything is put to right. Everything at all. Second Peter chapter 2. Peter talks quite a bit about the last times also in his second letter. And he talks about this dual purpose God, so to speak, how he, he protects the godly and judges the wicked. He said, if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. God can do both, and his judgment is perfect. His judgment for good and his judgment for evil. Matthew chapter 13, the great parable chapter of our Lord Jesus. He taught a, a story about the wheat and the tares. And perhaps you remember the story. Well, while the landowner sowed wheat in his field, an enemy came by night and sowed weed seed in it, tares. And it looked like wheat, but when it came up, when the wheat headed out the grain, you could tell the tares were different, and they discovered there was all sorts of weeds in there. And so the, uh, the angels came, the, wise, the uh, hired men came and said, shall we pull out the weeds? And the, the landowner said, no, leave them there until the harvest, and then take the good and gather it, and then stack the weeds in a pile and burn it. And here's what Jesus said was the interpretation. The field is the world. The good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun, in the kingdom of the Father. God knows how to protect the good and judge the wicked. Thirdly, God is patient and merciful, both at the same time. I just love when he appeared to Moses, and this, this description that God himself gave to Moses, Moses wanted to see God and talk to him face to face, and the Lord said, no, you can't. You can't see me and live. No one can see my face and live, but you can hide in this rock and I'll cover your face with my hand as I pass by. And after I pass by, then you can get a glimpse. But the Lord pronounced his name. That is, described himself, revealed his character to Moses. And this is what he said. The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. God is both merciful and 
patient. And we see this description that he gave Moses throughout the Old Testament. You run across it again and again in the Psalms and in the prophets and even in some of the historical stories, the narratives. People remembered this description that God gave that he is indeed slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. That's our God. That's the God we serve. Even in the plagues of Egypt, which is kind of a pattern for the plagues in Revelation, the trumpet judgments, the Lord told Pharaoh, I could have destroyed you many times over by now, and yet I'm patient. Why? 1 Timothy 2 tells us, God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And Peter tells us also, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. All that God does is to give people another chance, those that have not yet come to him, to give them another chance at repentance. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, Jesus said, and I will give you rest. God is patient, always giving us another chance. Fourth, fourthly, from Revelations 8, do not give up praying. Those of us that went canoeing yesterday, we had four rules to follow. Don't stand up in the boat. Which, you know, if you've ever been in a canoe, if you stood up, usually what happens is you're not standing long. The second rule is do not stand up in the boat. By that time, some wise people caught on and said, I bet the third rule is do not stand up in the boat. And they were right. I forgot the fourth one. What was the fourth one? Yeah, whatever it was. Uh, anyway, it wasn't, there was something else. But uh, the, the important thing was don't stand up in the boat. It's the same way with praying. Do not quit. Don't give up. Every letter that Paul wrote has some variation on that theme. When Jesus talks about praying, it's always when you continue to pray. Don't quit praying. The sense, the proper tense, that ask and it will be given you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. And it's a great promise, a wonderful verse that are familiar to us, but the proper uh, interpretation, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. That's what Jesus wants us to do. Our life should be full of prayer, constant prayer. Pray without ceasing, Paul says. Pray in all things. Give thanks for all things. Never, ever, 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 ever give up. And it's not really too difficult. We think, oh, I just can't do that. And these people in the Bible, they're something beyond me. But James says, no. Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And we, we take his example of Elijah and say, man, that's great. I wish I could be like that. But James doesn't stop. He says Elijah was a man just like us. He's not different than you and me, at least in his essence. The only difference is the will for us to stick with it. Are we as determined as Elijah to get through? Are we as determined to stick with it, to persevere in prayer as Elijah was until the way is clear? until we hear that voice of God. In Jeremiah chapter 22, Jeremiah uh, held up the prophets, the false prophets, as a bad example because they weren't spending time getting the Lord's word on things. They were just preaching what they thought was right. What we think is right makes little difference. What God says is right is, is what makes the difference. Don't give up. Don't give up praying. Don't give up listening to God and finding out the right way. Fifthly, from Revelation chapter 8, now is the day of salvation. It's not tomorrow. You can go out and witness to people, and somewhere along the line, you'll hear, I'm going to live my life now, and then later on when I get old or before I die, then I'll come to the Lord. 
A lot of people live life that way, but we don't know when that day will come. We don't know if we'll have that opportunity. We don't know if we'll harden our hearts by persisting in willful sin so that we can't come to him anymore. Now is the day of salvation. The Bible never says, put it off. You know, the procrastinator's code, put off till tomorrow what you could have, could have done today. That's not what the Lord wants because it gets harder and harder. The longer we persist in what is bad, the harder it is to turn to the good, all the more so in turning to Christ. It's true that it's never too late, but it's also true that the later we wait, the harder it is. Now is the day of salvation. And finally, the sixth point, therefore repent. <coughs> Seek the Lord while he may be found, Isaiah says. Seek the Lord, turn to him while he is near. When John the Baptist came, what was his message? The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And Mark 1, verse 15, records Jesus' message as well. The kingdom of God is near, Jesus preached. Therefore, repent. And Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, the Sermon on the Mount, our discipleship manual. As Jesus was beginning to draw to the end of his sermon, he talked about how we should uh, view life. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Repent. Come to me now, Jesus said. Come to me now while you can. Let us, with all of our hearts, heed the words of Jesus. Heed the message of Revelation, and come to Jesus with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. In Jesus' name, amen.